Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. I am Jennifer Joyce, Regional Vice President for Sales for the West here in Caduceus Technologies. And here with me today, I've got my partner in crime, Howard Butler, Senior Director of Systems Engineering. Howard, uh, I'll just introduce him real quick, is a 30 plus year veteran of Conducive. He is an absolute expert in the inner workings of the Windows operating system. So Howard, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks Jennifer, really glad to be here. And uh, hey guys out there, uh, don't let Jennifer's title fool you. Uh, she's been with the company for going on over a decade and uh, I think you'll find that she's quite technical as well. Now, one item I did have in mind, uh, kind of a quick housekeeping um, item, is that, th that we wanna try to keep this as interactive as possible. So feel free to uh, drop any questions you have in the Q&A uh, box over on the far right-hand side. And Jennifer and I will try to answer those as we go along or at the very least, we'll answer those questions at the end during a Q&A session. So again, Jennifer, thanks very much. It's my pleasure to be here today. Awesome, thanks, Howard. So we're gonna jump right in here. Uh, we're gonna start with a, another quick housekeeping item and that's our agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna be dividing today's presentation into two parts. First part will be the executive briefing. We're gonna keep that pretty high level, just kind of talk about the business climate around VDI and go into five real world use cases, which you can see listed here. And then we're gonna go into the technical briefing. So if you're time limited today, need to hop off after the executive briefing, feel free. We will uh, be recording the session and sending the link out to everyone after the recording. Um, so if you want uh, that technical deep dive, stick around for the second part as well. So we're gonna go ahead and jump right in here. Now, uh, quick, real high level about us. It's always good to know who you're talking with. We are a 39-year-old software company. And I just like to kind of call it our scout badges in the middle of the screen there. That's what I like to call them. Uh, specifically, we are a Microsoft Gold Partner and we have been since day one. There are only a handful of companies that have ever had access to the Microsoft operating system source code outside of Microsoft, and we are one of them. Uh, in fact, during Howard's tenure here um, at the company, he was able to work with that source code and gain some really deep insights into the inner workings of the Windows operating system. And he is gonna be talking about some of the technical aspects of Velocity and how it interfaces with Windows to literally transform IO. That's gonna be a major theme that we're talking about today is IO transformation to be much more efficient and give you much faster data throughput. Uh, we're also a Citrix Ready certified partner and we are a VMware TAP partner. Now we're going to jump right into uh, kind of the, the landscape right now and why we're talking about VDI today. This is why we, we launched this webinar series in the first place. Uh, now we're all familiar with the S curve of product adoption. Um, you know, when something hits 90%, it's considered fully saturated and mature. A lot of products never get there and you never know how long a product's going to take to get there if it does. You know, kind of roll through a couple of examples here, uh, kind of tongue in cheek here. I didn't actually put a horse and buggy on here, but we got some uh, kind of examples of things that are obsolete or going obsolete well past maturity. Uh, you know, hard drives, for example, um, we're about an 80 to 90% adoption rate for SSDs from the customers we've been talking with in most environments, which means, uh, you know, HDDs are now heavily on the decline. And while there's still quite a bit of tiered storage out there, uh, we're seeing it being massively displaced by all flash, which is now starting to get a little crowded by hyperconverged. So we have some other technologies uh, to talk about as well. But uh, here at Conducive, it's really been interesting because it's, it's like being in the catbird seat. It's, we really have a Gartner-like view into what's trending in IT and we have our finger on the pulse. And that's because we talk to so many different companies every week from small to medium businesses to the largest enterprises in the world. And this is because of what our software does and where it installs right within the Windows operating system at the top of the IT stack. And we're gonna get into that a bit more as well. Uh, but because of this, we really get this unique bird's eye view down. Like for example, with virtualization, uh, when that was coming across the landscape uh, back you know, a decade ago, uh, when folks were still just in the very early planning stages, it was only two or three years and they got to 75% adoption. And now it's definitely at 99% uh, and it's been there for a long time. Now, just like watching virtualization spread across the landscape, we are now watching cloud, 
uh, VDI and hyperconverged infrastructures accelerating into that curve. And from what we're seeing right now, hyperconverged probably has got the most momentum out of the three. Cloud is being um, obviously adopted and talked about a lot on golf courses right now, more than actually being implemented on a broad scale. Um, there's definitely a lot of whining and dying, dining going on on that, but people are still having a really hard time biting off the cost of exporting an entire data center out to the cloud. And with data security concerns as well, they've been hesitant. Uh, we've actually seen people who have taken that leap go full circle and come back and build out whole new data centers to bring everything back in house. So that one's still going through an interesting um, evolution on that growth curve. But let's talk about VDI. That's what we're here to talk about today. It's just at an inflection point of acceleration which is really interesting because, uh, you know, obviously we've had this major shift in um, our demography of users going to home offices and it's really accelerated. So why don't we talk about this a little bit more in what are the benefits of VDI? They're pretty clear, mobility and productivity, um, streamlining management to a single platform, uh, having a single image, low maintenance endpoints, um, central management, a lot of different uh, areas that this really helps, but there are also some barriers. We're dealing with a lot of complexity. It's very expensive. It takes a lot of hardware and software to deploy it, and it's also difficult to deploy and manage. It takes a lot of in-house expertise to pull this off. And the other thing too is we do have users who are very attached to their personal physical device, and they also have the perception, if not reality, that their performance is better on a dedicated system, and so they will also resist. And finally, uh, one of the biggest barriers has been that people really do report that TCO is still higher on traditional um, uh, for, excuse me, TCO for VDI can also still be higher than traditional dedicated endpoints. Um, so that's also been a bit of a barrier. So kind of not been popular in a lot of realms, but it is really gaining traction. We're starting to see more and more uh, deployments. Now VDI is here to stay. It has enough of a foothold. There's enough technology wrapped around behind it uh, that it is here to stay. And now with um, everything that's been happening. We've got telecommuting normalizing. We've got support by both the telecommuters and the corporations and a lot of convenience. The thing about this that's really interesting is that it's really gonna get a lot of support now that the TCO will make sense because corporations are gonna realize they don't need to keep all of that real estate to keep all of those seats in place. Uh, so now we're gonna see it embraced even more. And I think we're gonna have a, a very rapid inflection point and uh, acceleration to that growth curve. Now. And this was kind of an interesting conversation that I had with one of our customers recently. They are an existing server customer deployed on over 400 servers in their enterprise. And they were struggling a little bit with VDI and looking at their backend throughput. And they weren't making the metrics that they needed and wanted to be making. In fact, they had recently had to cut their density in half. Uh, and part of that was because of their upgrade to Windows 10. And they were looking at having to buy a lot more hardware to support the existing user community. So they went to the publisher of their tier one uh, a tier one vendor for their um, application that they were running in the environment. And they asked for suggestions of how they could improve throughput metrics so that they wouldn't have to increase their v decrease their VDI density further and wouldn't have to buy more hardware. And the advice they got back was kind of ironic because the question was, how do we avoid buying more hardware? How do we improve throughput? And they were told buy more hardware. <laughs> so it didn't quite work. The second piece of advice that they were given was assess everything in the image. Not real helpful because usually if you're gonna assess everything in the image, it's not like you have a lot of options. You already have the applications and the image that you think you need there. Probably not gonna be able to rewrite code because you probably don't own the application and the source code to it. Um, so not real practical. And as I was listening to these recommendations, I kind of had this aha moment and I said, you know, uh, the Windows OS is in the image. And we both got a good laugh. Um, he was laughing because he said, you know, you're absolutely right. And and he laughed because it was so obvious because it's easy to miss. And he already knew what Velocity could do for the Windows operating system because of his experience in the server farm. It accelerates throughput by a minimum of 30 to 40%. So let's hop into the first use case that we want to review here today. So the first use case is from our Citrix Zen desktop um, uh, certification testing. Now we had a lot of data come out of this and um, we really just wanted to condense it down to one slide because it was just too much data to share. But we basically, with the velocity disabled and velocity enabled, we were able to increase the data transaction rates by 90%. And during the same amount of time, 60% more workload got processed. And uh, that was part of our, our certification testing for Citrix Ready certification. 
Now, what I'd really like to focus on real quick is what I like to refer to as the two IO fallacies or the two IO myths. And these are two IO myths that are really kind of a, a new way to look at this. Now, the first one with the IOPS fallacy, what I like to call the IOPS fallacy is the, the myth is that I have more than enough IOPS to handle the workload. Now, when I first started becoming aware of this myth was actually a customer I was working with who was doing a proof of concept of velocity. Their environment was with a pure flash SAN, all flash, 600,000 IOPS, and they only had 11 servers attached to it and they were missing their SLAs. And in one of our early calls, they said, Jennifer, I have 600,000 IOPS on an all flash pure SAN and I only have 11 servers attached to it. What can you possibly do to help our performance and help us meet our SLAs? And instantly, I got a picture popped into my head of this cathedral in a city that I lived in in Spain. This thing was massive. It had six story ceilings in it. And the entire year I lived there, I barely went into it because it was so crowded all the time. I couldn't move through it. My last week living there, I walked by and I saw that it was empty. I went in and I could walk right through it. What I didn't realize was that it was the year of the saint and the year of the saint had just ended. And that pilgrimage that had been happening that whole year also ended. I was now able to walk straight through that cathedral. Now, the reason it popped into my head was six story ceilings, 600,000 IOPS. The useful space was only the five to six feet of space that all of the people are standing in. We couldn't use the six stories above us. Same thing with our IOPS ratings. We're only using a very small percentage of that IOPS rating. So what we want to do is maximize the percentage that we can use, organize that. And that is where we're going to get that 30 to 40 percent boost, if not more. The reality is that the workloads that we're actually doing that we're actually processing are running 30 to 40 pence percent slower than they need to be due to the nature of the IO. And this is where we're gonna start talking about IO transformation. The IO is split, it's small, it's random. And that is very difficult to process. And that pattern is also generated by windows. It's not generated by hardware. Hardware has to cope with that. Now, another thing that we wanna talk about in the reality piece here is that sequential IO always outperforms random IO. And the truth of the matter is, and this is what we talked about, is that only a small percentage of the total I.O. capacity is used at any one time. That's the part we need to focus on, and that's what we need to make go faster. All of the overheads doesn't serve us. Or overhead, excuse me, headroom doesn't serve us. Now, we get a false sense of performance security because we have the high IOPS ratings, even though we're not using it. And that kind of leads us into the second I.O. fallacy, which is I.O. response time ratings. We just want to focus on the work that's being done, not the spare capacity that isn't being used. So let's talk really quickly about the IO response time fallacy. Now, we can get really misled by IO response time. We look at the sub millisecond response time on individual IOs and it gives us this false sense of security that things are going as fast as they possibly can. But this does not take into account the full nature of the IO. So the myth is that faster IO response time is better. The reality is that one individual smaller I.O. transfers faster than one individual larger I.O. So if you took a 4K I.O. versus a 64K I.O., the 4K I.O. is going to transfer faster. So we're really getting ourselves into a forest and a trees type situation if we're focused only on our I.O. response time. What we really want to look at is kilobytes per second and data throughput. The other thing it doesn't take into account, not only is the individual size of the I.O., but it doesn't take into account the, the formation of the I.O. Is it split or is it contiguous? Is it random or is it sequential? These three things, the size of the I.O., if it's split versus contiguous and random versus sequential, all add up to the perfect trifecta for either fast storage performance or slow storage performance. The real truth of the matter is that the individual I.O. response time just like IOPS ratings, has been over-prioritized in this performance analysis equation. So overall throughput is always slower when data is transferred with split, small, random I.O. And the opposite is also true. Overall throughput is always faster when data is transferred with contiguous, larger, sequential I.O. So we're going to hop into the first, or the second use case, excuse me. Now this one was benchmarked uh, in a uh, hospital environment. And Howard 
why don't I uh, bring this over to you to kind of take everyone through what we're looking at here. Sure, thanks very much, Jennifer. <clears throat> so let's take a quick look at what IO transformation is with velocity and what it can do. So we're gonna go through these slides kind of quickly. So I advise you just to kind of sit down, relax, buckle up, but pay attention here. Now, the nice thing is that we can validate these type of measurements with third-party tools that you probably already have in place in your environment, like VROPS, which is what we used at this particular hospital. The orange bar is the measurements with velocity. And as you can see, there's a pretty nice trend of improvement in write requests per second. But Jennifer, if we go to the next slide here, and I go, huh? What's up with this write latency? Kind of speaking to what Jennifer was talking about, if you consider if this was the only metric that you looked at, you might walk away and think that velocity was slowing everything down. This kind of ties back into what Jennifer was talking about in terms of IO response time myth. So now let's see what happens in the next, next metric. Go to the next slide. Wait, now take a look at this. Right rate just kind of shoots through the roof once velocity has been enabled. So Jennifer, if you'll do me the favor, go back to the previous slide. Okay, so while looking at the right latency, you can kind of see sometimes the latency goes up by three times or more longer. So now let's look at the right rate. And as on the throughput metric here, the right rate, the amount of data that you can manipulate or, or focus on is anywhere between two and six times the volume of data. So this kind of goes to show the power of focusing on overall throughput of the data and not really being caught up on individual IO response time. So let's take a look at what happens on the read side of things. Okay, so here we get something similar on the read latency. It appears that it's gotten much worse uh, in terms of the amount of, of time it takes to satisfy an individual request. But if we take a look at the next slide, it's just, we're just killing it. It's off the charts in terms of read rate. Again, the volume of data that you can work with, throughput uh, that is accomplished is just tremendous here. So now, if we go on to this next slide here, thanks, Jennifer. And I wanna throw one more metric out there and that's disk usage. We think the picture pretty much speaks for itself, but let me just mention, this isn't about end user experience, okay? Of course, it always comes down to that. Well. Why do you have your VDI density count set to where it is today? And that is because of the user experience. You don't want to oversaturate your system, so you kind of build it out to have that uh, equal level type of, of experience to the user. So when you install Velocity, it really wouldn't be valid to go back and ask your users if they noticed anything faster, because you've already kind of optimized and geared uh, the system towards that end user experience by scaling down your VDI density. So with Velocity installed, you can scale that back up and still keep the end user experience at its optimum. And if we go to the next slide, Jennifer, and I just wanna to touch upon one more point here, and that is how important this concept of IO transformation really is. And I'll get to you know, a greater technical detail uh, when we get into the technical portion, the Q&A portion and stuff like that a little bit later on. But just looking at this at a high level, I think it kind of sums it up. And that is what we want to have happen to the right IOs. And if we take these split small random IOs and can transform, transform those into larger, more contiguous sequential IOs, 
that is really the key to getting back 30 to 40 percent of your throughput capabilities now your your hardware should be able to perform faster but the way windows is handling things um, from a logical point of view it's kind of like windows has got its foot on the brake pedal of this fast ferrari or maserati that you have so think of velocity as kind of pressing down on the accelerator um, and make, helping things go faster and be able to process more data. Now let's take a look at this third case, Jennifer. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is another horizon view environment running on a pure all flash type of storage array. And again, we tested or collected the data using VROPS. And the numbers are from a Fortune 500 company. In fact, it's one of those household name cable companies that you're probably all familiar with. And this was a sampling from their call center. So disk usage rate is significantly better, more often than not double in most cases with velocity than without. And if we move on to the next slide here, the commands per second improve significantly. Again, more than double in most cases. And when we take a look at the average number of write requests, we can see that across the board, every system is realizing a very significant increase in activity or productivity. And then we can take a look at the write rate, again, measured in kilobytes per second. This shows the average number of kilobytes written to the disk each second. And we can see across the board, every system has realized a significant increase in throughput or activity. And this ties right back to velocity being able to transform those split random IOs into contiguous sequential type of data streams. And then when we take a look at the read rate, we can see the average number of kilobytes per read for each second. And we realize that there is a very significant increase in activity as well for the reads. So we got two more cases here, and I'll try to get through them kind of quickly here, and then we'll get into the technical briefing part. But just to wrap this one up, in fact, it's one of our partners that did a, a proof of concept and brought the results back to their customer. And the conclusion was at the of the net result is that if velocity was enabled across the board on all their systems, they could run double the number of VDI clients in their environment and possibly up to five times more with just a little bit additional RAM on some of these systems. And it's much better than having to go over and purchase more hosts and spread the workload out across more physical iron uh, at a very substantial cost. So velocity can have a very significant savings in terms of your hardware footprint. So when we look at this, just kind of give you that before and after type of, of comparison, we clearly have nearly the identical number of systems. And you can see that there was a decrease in CPU usage and a greater amount of activity. Now granted, the memory usage did go up, but that's memory associated to some of our technologies in terms of caching and so forth, but it's really only using free, idle, unused memory that would have been wasted anyway. So it's not taking memory away from somebody else, it's just making better use of that existing resource. And let's, you know, if we can dynamically use a portion of that memory, memory to memory data transfers are many times faster and far more efficient than doing transactions the old fashioned way. So if we take a look here at the next slide, and this is our fifth and final case. This was tested in a load balanced Citrix terminal server environment. They picked 10 systems to install Velocity on, and then they had another 10 systems, different systems, to use as a control group. The customer tested using vSphere, sent us the data back, and we were able to conclude that they would have had a 32% improvement in reads 
and an 18% improvement in rights. That's very significant. So I think that kind of wraps up the use cases. And I hope this information has been rather helpful to kind of see the power of what can be done. So Jennifer, I'm going to kind of toss this back over to you now, and we'll continue on. Great. Thank you very much, Howard. I appreciate you covering all of those. Um, okay, so before we go into part two of the uh, webinar today of the um, technical deep dive, I'm just going to touch real quick on what the steps are for proof of concept. Um, so, you know, what you can expect to get out of a proof of concept is better application performance, increased VM density, extended hardware lifecycle, especially faster data transfer rates, um, things like that. So uh, a lot of benefits to be had from addressing the inefficiencies in the software layer with the software solution rather than over-focusing on the hardware layer, which is probably already quite upgraded and robust as it is. And a large number of benefits that we see from people as well, um, just coming back to us having used us in their VDI environments. And you will be receiving a copy of this uh, slide deck so you can get a copy of these uh, statements from our customers as well. Now, what it takes to do the proof of concept is uh, very, very lightweight. Uh, first, we will schedule you for a pre-POC consultation. The goal of this is to see if your environment would be a good fit for Velocity or not, uh, and also to let you know what the exact steps and create a customized POC plan for your environment. Um, in typically in a VDI environment, you simply install Velocity in the master image. You can use any of the types of third-party benchmarking tools you have in-house, like we just demonstrated, to collect before and after baselines. And then we will help you with the analysis. We'll also help you write a formal business review uh, and technical review for submission. So that's pretty much the process. Most of our VDI POCs wrap up in under two weeks. Now, uh, the steps, I just kind of went through these steps, but uh, here's a, a list of the steps in writing for you to review later when you receive the slide deck. And now we're going to go ahead and hop right into the technical portion of the call today. So let's dig in under the hood of exactly how Velocity does this. Now, rudimentary extraction here of an environment, of a virtual environment. I think one of the, the biggest takeaways here is that you know, virtualization has been great for server efficiency, and it's one of the biggest downsides of it, though, is that it does add complexity to the data path. Uh, we've got a lot of cost savings by having virtualized, and Velocity will just help get rid of kind of the gremlins in the system is what I like to kind of call them. Um, this is what your end IO stream ends up actually looking like once you've virtualized. And let me explain a little bit about this. There are two severe IO inefficiencies that are at the source of this. The first one is really the Windows behavior, and that's where we sit and that's what we fix. IO characteristics are much smaller and more fractured and more random than they need to be. Um, it's kind of a death by a thousand cut scenario. So everything is running, but not nearly as fast as it could be, as we described with the IOPS fallacy and the IO response time fallacy. Most people end up throwing a lot more hardware at it. That could either be premature, over-provisioned, and you know, maybe instead of 10 pounds of hardware, you only needed eight pounds of hardware. And we have that, that headroom that's going to waste and not really being used, used that much. So that's all sourced within the Windows operating system. The second level of inefficiency is the IO blender effect, which I think is well illustrated here. And actually, I'm going to give you a quick story uh, example of one of our customers uh, on a SQL Server environment that wanted to deploy to one VM out of 120 SQL VMs on this cluster because that one they were missing a customer SLA on. And every month when they missed that SLA, they had a $10,000 chargeback penalty to that account. So they were very keen to fix it. They wanted to deploy just to the one VM, and we let them know that they could do that, and we would optimize that one VM, but they probably were still going to miss their SLAs because of the IO blender effect or the IO contention from the neighbors, the noisy neighbors, cranking up their, their music at 3 a.m. so no one can sleep kind of a thing. So they did this. It didn't work. They missed the SLA. They then gave us 10 of their busiest servers in that cluster. The next month, they made the SLA for the first time in over a year by three minutes. Um, the next month, the software was removed. They missed the SLA by five minutes, and the CFO noticed. So the following month, we got permission to deploy to 119 VMs of the 120. They made the SLA by 17 minutes. 
We also had them go back and check their change control logs, which were very strict, uh, to find out if there were any other major changes made concurrent to our proof of concept and there had not been. So we were able to very safely say that velocity was uh, was the defining factor that got them to start making those SLAs consistently. So that's a really good illustration of the IO Blender effect. Now, the next thing I wanna to touch on is what really is velocity? Where do we sit? What about our compatibility? So the orange bar that you see here is right in the OS. That's where velocity installs. As I mentioned earlier, it is a 100% software solution. It is for Windows. And it really comprises of two light filter, uh, two light mini file filter drivers. Um, it's fenced by Windows, and it only talks to Windows. That means that we're fully compatible with the entire environment. And it's really important as well um, that we sit where we do because it's the name of the slide actually, top of the stack. We are right at the source where the data is being issued. And that's where we can affect that IO transformation that Howard was talking about earlier. So we're treating the source versus the symptoms. And this is where we get to change and transform that small fractured randomized IO into larger, fewer sequential IOs. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the right optimization engine of how we do that. Um, how we do the IO transformation. We'll get into some read optimization where we actually have what we call a tier zero caching strategy for read caching, and we are only caching reads. We do not cache any or buffer any writes. Um, and we will also talk a little bit about our reporting capabilities when the, within the software. And again, if uh, anybody does have another obligation, we'll be wrapping up in the next five minutes, but if you have another obligation and need to drop, please feel free. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar. Also, if there are any questions, just a quick reminder, it's a good time to start dropping those in as well because we are on the home sweat stretch here. So I'm going to um, touch real briefly on our IntelliWrite. And actually, Howard, uh, maybe this would be a great slide for you to touch on if you wouldn't mind. Sure. So when we take a look at this, you know, this is one of our, our main technology engines. Um, and, you know, we're sitting inside of Windows, helping Windows identify where to properly write the data um, rather than grabbing the next available tiny segment of free space. And Microsoft had some really brilliant engineers when they developed the file system. And they knew it would be kind of a fool's errand to try to keep track of all the individual chunks of space and, and so forth. But we've been able to come up with, with a technology that allows us to provide the information to Windows in a very organized and efficient manner, such that we can identify how large a file might become, uh, how much data is it going to occupy or how much space, where are the larger chunks of free space, and simply pass that information to Windows such that Windows doesn't split or break apart the individual pieces of the file and send them out to, to storage individually. So what you have here is part of that IO transformation. Think of this, if you had an application and it wants to send an IO request to write 64 KB worth of data, Windows may break that up into 16 4KB slices and send 16 individual I.O. requests out to storage. Each of those I.O. requests takes a certain amount of time to complete. But with our technology, if we can tell Windows, hey, you don't need to break this apart, you can pass that single I.O. request, that 64KB request, straight through to storage, and here's the the range of logical clusters for the free space that you could allocate, you can do so in all, all in one motion. So it's a difference between, you know, doing let's say 100,000 IOs to write a megabyte or a gigabyte of data. With our technology, we could reduce that down to 50 or even 70,000 IOs, which is a very significant reduction in individual IO uh, activity. Great, thank you, Howard, I appreciate that. So, you know, as Howard just touched on, reducing and transforming the IO from, you know, 100,000 IOs down to 70,000 IOs, which are larger sequential and no longer split, um, it, uh, it really does make a big difference. And this is what's behind 
all of those graphs you saw in the use cases where you saw the kilobytes per second throughput shoot out the roof two to six times higher consistently on the different workloads that we, lo we, we looked at. Now, the second and final engine that we're going to talk about is called IntelliMemory, and this is our patented DRAM read cache engine. Again, what I like to call our tier zero caching strategy. Just a couple quick key points about this. Uh, there's no resource contention. Um, the, and you know what I like to think about on this engine is that the real genius of the engine is that it is completely dynamic. And it will only uh, borrow memory that is free, available, and otherwise unused. In fact, Howard, you've got a, a great illustration of this here. Um, if you wouldn't mind just adding on a couple more comments on this before we go to our last couple of slides here. So yeah, this is an animation kind of showing you how the Velocity product dynamically adjusts the memory usage for its cache, only using memory that's free, available, idle memory that would otherwise just be unused anyway on the system. It's also intelligent enough, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, to know when there is a demand for memory and it will release memory from its cache and give that back to Windows. So there's really never going to be a shortage of free memory. Uh, and this would keep Windows and other applications quite happy. Yeah, and, and the last thing that I wanted to share with you guys today as well is two very interesting recommendations uh, from VMware directly. Now this document uh, is an excerpt here from VMware's uh, Disk IO Performance Enhancement Advice from their vSphere Monitoring and Performance document. Um, and it's really interesting because kind of segueing from our memory conversation, the very first recommendation says increase the virtual machine memory. And it basically says it should allow the operating system to do more caching, thereby offloading reads at the VM. Well, we all know that there's plenty of memory sitting there already and the Windows OS isn't doing more caching. But what it is saying is leverage a tier zero cache strategy right inside the VM and use that otherwise unused DRAM to offload IO at the VM. That's exactly what we do. And we do it in an enterprise class way in a way that won't interfere with your environment and plays very nicely in the sandbox. And guess what number two says? Defragment the file system on all guests. Well, we haven't really been talking about defragmentation today. And the reason we haven't been talking about defragmentation is because with our software in place, defragmentation is obsolete. It is no longer necessary because the fragmentation doesn't exist in the first place. And if you recall, I was talking about small split, uh, uh, you know, chopped up, random, non-sequential I.O. That's fragmentation. When our software gets installed, you on the original write on a pass through basis, get large sequential contiguous I.O. So there is no defragmentation needed. There's nothing to defragment. Everything's sequential in the first place. So we also have a very eloquent enterprise class solution to meet the second recommendation to optimize your performance and these recommendations directly from VMware. So this is what our UI looks like. Uh, it will show you your IO transformation numbers, how many read IOs we were able to eliminate, how many write IOs we were able to eliminate, what the net result is of your storage IO performance and throughput time saved. We also have a console uh, that you can get seen, you know, high level metrics from the entire uh, view, global view of the environment and what optimization is happening. Uh, okay, so we're going to wrap up. This is uh, our contact information. Want to just go ahead and um, thank everybody for attending today. I'm not actually seeing any questions in the chat box, so we're just going to go ahead and wrap up. If you did have any questions that you didn't have a chance to put in the chat box, we will be having uh, one of our team members reach out to you to schedule a call, a consultation with myself, Howard, or one of our counterparts uh, here in the next few days. And we look forward to helping you with, uh, with Velocity and exploring to see what it might be able to do for your environment. Howard, thank you very much for your time today as well. All right, Jennifer. Well, thank you very much. And everyone have a pleasant day.